Okay. Let me share my screen with you. Okay. All right. So this showing up. This should be the this is the last slide from yesterday. All right. So don't type anything down on the guided notes that you pulled up from this morning because you already typed this out from yesterday. So usually when I have two parters, you know, this is what we did part one yesterday on a section. Um, I usually start with the last slide that we covered just to do a little kind of a recap here. So yesterday we were discussing section two, which is tied of chapter one, which is titled who are us citizens? Who makes up what's the makeup of uh, of the United States? Uh, and essentially, yesterday was kind of a history of immigration, right? Which because the United States um, immigration it plays a major role in in our, in our makeup. You know, they often say we're a nation of immigrants, right? And um, we were talking about like you know various like uh, kind of like like eras. Um, there was kind of two waves after we gained our independence uh, that we had talked about yesterday. The first wave, uh, which was the late 1700s up until the kind of uh, mid to late 1800s, primarily those that were coming to the United States. And, 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 and we were encouraging immigration. We were a young country. We needed population. We needed people to work. And as we started to industrialize more, we needed more and more cheap labor, essentially. Um, so we talked about the first wave being primarily from Northern and Western Europe. Um, you know, uh, a lot of play of England, uh, Germany, uh, with Scandinavia. Like if you ever go to like up to Chicago, there's segments of, of like kind of neighborhoods still that are kind of like separated based on like kind of immigrant populations in the kind of uh, 1800s. Um, they're mainly Protestant with the exception of, of many of the Irish. Uh, and there's also, I was talking about, there's various what we call push-pull factors for um, immigration. Um, the push factors would be kind of things that would kind of force people out of their countries, be it political violence or be it like um, famine. For example, with the Irish diaspora in the 1840s, the potato famine played a big role in that. Um, the second wave of immigration, which is generally kind of started about the kind of the mid late to kind of late 1800s into the early part of the 20th century. Um, we see more and more immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, places like China, places uh, Latin America, places like that. Um, with that, there's a little bit of pushback, all right? We were talking about there's a, that, um, that concept of nativism, where there are people that um, feel the influx of people who don't maybe necessarily look like them or have the same kind of culture like them tend to kind of, uh, kind of react in, uh, in a way. And so they talk about the nativism and like political parties like the American party, the know nothings and stuff like that. Um, the 1920s, we start to see a um, limit on immigration. Uh, the establishment of many what they call quota acts. A quota is just essentially a limit on things. So the uh, 1921, which is kind of parlays after the First World War and that, um, the Emergency Quota Act sets a limit on who could come based on, on countries. All right. So that was, um, that was uh, amended in 1924, our immigration policy, the Immigration Act, which like it says here, um, admits people from a country to 2% from a country. Now it's based on census numbers, and we'll talk about a census. This year is a census year where we just take account of of who lives in the United States. So this was the idea. This dramatically dropped the number of immigrants coming into into the United States. All right, and so um, this here is an image of President Calvin Coolidge at the time signing uh, this into law. Now the guy over his right shoulder in the military garb, that's. Um, that's General Pershing, who um, led the American forces in World War One. So this is kind of like with his presence there. This is um, giving it a little bit of cachet, so to speak. All right, um, but it's based a little bit on nativist kind of like kind of policies, if you will. All right. Um, Kind of a bad pie graph there because it's a little faded, but this pie graph kind of shows, like, particularly when it comes to kind of northern, western, and southern Eastern Europe, where immigration is coming from in the days. And so you definitely see, like, kind of a, a you know, like at one point, 1890s, 1900, a definite kind of uh, majority southern Eastern European, particularly 1900, 1910, up to 1920. And then after the Immigration Acts, right, this, the, the one in the bottom middle to the bottom right, you see that kind of, kind of that pendulum swinging back a little bit. Um, and so pretty much throughout our history we've been we were kind of continuing these kind of quotas 
uh, based on where people are from, what countries they are. Now, in 1965, that was that quota based on people coming from particular countries uh, was uh, was was changed. All right. And so what they did was they started doing like kind of an annual quota. Um, 1990, the kind of the kind of current policy we have is kind of based on the, is mainly based on the Immigration Act of 1990, which sets a total quota, no matter where from, coming to 675,000 and uh, starting in 1995. It was re, uh, I think in the early 2000s changed it to about 800,000. So I believe now the current law states that um, total kind of legal immigration coming into the United States uh, is capped at 800,000. All right. And so um, this act, this Immigration Act, which has been amended over a period of time here, since, about, you know, since the 30 years, um, sets criteria for who has essentially maybe preferential treatment or preferential like status on on your uh, application for citizenship or for entry into the into the country, if you will. All right. So um, the uh, the. Preferences here are first those who are married, husbands, wives, and ch are children of U.S. citizens. All right. So if you're a U.S. citizen, you're married to a foreign national, um, and you want to bring them to the country here. Uh, they generally have a you know prefer the you know that's that's the kind of uh, most preferred uh, um, kind of way to get into the country. But the second one, those with valuable job skills. Um, the idea is that it states that you don't want to necessarily be um, dependent upon government services as much and stuff like that. Um, and then the third one would be those who, and it's kind of an antiquated term, aliens, right? But anybody, you know, a permanent resident of the U.S. who are still citizens of another country. And you do have people who have dual citizenship, right? And so, um, meaning they're a citizen of both the United States and, and, and another country. Um, so, uh, and the, the term aliens has been changed um, over time. So, like I said, it's a little bit of an antiquated uh, term. So, these are the kind of the preferential treatment. Generally, like for the first one, um, like usually it's like kind of like uh, five years after you kind of apply for citizenship um, uh, that you can that you can become a citizen or go through the process of that. Uh, those of who are married, uh, it's three years. That's as of the recent uh, recent law. All right. So, like I said, our, primarily our immigration policy is kind of is uh, kind of steered by this uh, act uh, from 1990. All right. I'm gonna make sure you guys got this before I move on. It's hard to tell. It's like I'm talking to myself. So, am I moving too fast for anybody? Just shout out, say slow down, hold down. No. I didn't get it. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure. Okay. All right. Um, and so becoming a U.S. citizen, you have to go to again, there's there's there's, you know, a couple of ways that people become U.S. citizens. Right. One is you're, you know, basically you're native born, all right, being born in the U.S. or both parents are citizens. All right. That's pretty simple. Um, and uh, and the other one is going through the process we refer to as naturalization. All right. So this is when someone who can, kind of, it, it, you know, be, you know, from someone who, like it says, they're an alien or somebody who is like uh, has, who works in the country or whatever, who has uh, has gone through the steps uh, kind of established through the Immigration Act of 1990 uh, in becoming a U.S. citizen. Basically, what those who go through naturalization are doing, kind of what you guys are doing right now, they essentially take a government class uh, and they, um, you know, and they they take a constitution test. And usually there's a ceremony and there's a ceremony like 4th of July is a big one. It's not the only day they do this, but the 4th of July is a lot of times um, they'll have like like a big kind of naturalization swearing in ceremony and stuff like that uh, at various places, courthouses and stuff like that. Um, in, in the in the summer uh, during the Republican convention, uh, National Convention, Donald President Trump um, uh gave gave uh i think it was like six or seven people they were kind of sworn in as as u.s citizens so that's kind of unique that doesn't usually occur all right um but again it's something like kind of what you guys are doing all right kind of taking a constitution test taking the kind of learning the you know the the ins and outs of of american government and stuff like that all right um 
So those are generally kind of the two ways. Now, how people get here, how they achieve that naturalization, um, like I said, usually through the legal process or whatever, sometimes there's some gray area in there. Um, and also we have a number of people who come to this country. We're talking like in immigration, there's oftentimes a lot of what we call kind of push factors. Uh, this is this has been something that was somewhat, you know, unfortunately kind of like kind of tossed around as a political football at times is um, the kind of classification of people who we refer to as refugees, people fleeing persecution in their home country. This within the, the Immigration Act initially is kind of is not subject to quota policies. All right. There are certain like kind of um, exceptions to the rule in certain cases. However, and the recent administration has tried to kind of um, push the courts and kind of trying to challenge some of these um, these uh, kind of like policies uh, to where people are exempt from kind of quotas. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do here, and because it's a short notice, it's kind of a short video, um, presentation. I'm going to show this video here from TED Ed. Um, like they they do some and interesting videos where they kind of like uh, um, have cartoons and stuff like that, but um, they're actually pretty good with information and providing stuff. So um, I'll let me mute my mic, if you don't mind, and then I'm gonna play this video uh, about refugees and what refugees go through to kind of like get to, you know, to kind of fleeing their home countries. Let's see. Around the globe, there are approximately 60 million people who have been forced to leave their homes to escape war, violence, and persecution. The majority of them have become internally displaced persons, which means they have fled their homes but are still within their own countries. Others have crossed a border and sought shelter outside of their own countries. They are commonly referred to as refugees. But what exactly does that term mean? The world has known refugees for millennia, but the modern definition was drafted in the UN's 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees in response to mass persecutions and displacements of the Second World War. It defines a refugee as someone who is outside their country of nationality and is unable to return to their home country because of well-founded fears of being persecuted. That persecution may be due to their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion, and is often related to war and violence. Today, roughly half the world's refugees are children, some of them unaccompanied by an adult, a situation that makes them especially vulnerable to child labor or sexual exploitation. Each refugee's story is different, and many must undergo dangerous journeys with uncertain outcomes. But before we get to what their journeys involve, let's clear one thing up. There's a lot of confusion regarding the difference between the terms migrant and refugee. Migrants usually refers to people who leave their country for reasons not related to persecution, such as searching for better economic opportunities or leaving drought-stricken areas in search of better circumstances. There are many people around the world who have been displaced because of natural disasters, food insecurities, and other hardships. But international law, rightly or wrongly, only recognizes those fleeing conflict and violence as refugees. So what happens when someone flees their country? Most refugee journeys are long and perilous, with limited access to shelter, water, or food. Since the departure can be sudden and unexpected, belongings might be left behind, and people who are evading conflict often do not have the required documents like visas to board airplanes and legally enter other countries. Financial and political factors can also prevent them from traveling by standard routes. This means they can usually only travel by land or sea and may need to entrust their lives to smugglers to help them cross borders. Whereas some people seek safety with their families, others attempt passage alone and leave their loved ones behind with the hopes of being reunited later. This separation can be traumatic and unbearably long. While more than half the world's refugees are in cities, sometimes the first stop for a person fleeing conflict is a refugee camp, 
usually run by the United Nations Refugee Agency or local governments. Refugee camps are intended to be temporary structures, offering short-term shelter until inhabitants can safely return home, be integrated to the host country, or resettle in another country. But resettlement and long-term integration options are often limited. So many refugees are left with no choice but to remain in camps for years and sometimes even decades. Once in a new country, the first legal step for a displaced person is to apply for asylum. At this point, they are an asylum seeker and not officially recognized as a refugee until the application has been accepted. While countries by and large agree on one definition of refugee, Every host country is responsible for examining all requests for asylum and deciding whether applicants can be granted the status of refugee. Different countries' guidelines can vary substantially. Host countries have several duties towards people they have recognized as refugees, like the guarantee of a minimum standard of treatment and non-discrimination. The most basic obligation towards refugees is non-refoulement, a principle preventing a nation from sending an individual to a country where their life and freedom are threatened. In reality, however, refugees are frequently the victims of inconsistent and discriminatory treatment. They are increasingly obliged to rebuild their lives in the face of xenophobia and racism. And all too often, they aren't permitted to enter the workforce and are fully dependent on humanitarian aid. In addition, far too many refugee children are out of school due to lack of funding for education programs. If you go back in your own family history, chances are you will discover that at a certain point your ancestors were forced from their homes, either escaping a war or fleeing discrimination and persecution. It would be good of us to remember their stories when we hear of refugees currently displaced, searching for a new home. You're muted. You're muted. Around the globe, there are approximately... All right, sorry about that. Um, so, like, with uh, with refugees in that status there, like St. Louis, if you ever go to St. Louis, um, there's a sizable Bosnian population in St. Louis. Uh, many of those came over in the 90s. Many of those Bosnians came over in the 90s. Uh, there was a kind of a civil war in the region of the Balkans there. So many of them were kind of exempt from that kind of uh, from the Immigration Act of 1990, uh, 1990. And so like to kind of with the deal when we're talking about like kind of the difference between refugee and to a certain extent kind of what we call um, kind of economic refugees or migrants and that. Um, it's generally kind of guided by uh, the Immigration Act and uh, uh, Reform and Control Act of 1986. Uh, when talking about those who are um, here, are primarily uh, what we call undocumented. All right. So um, this was during uh, the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Um, there's this the, out of this kind of is the term that some people read, you know, who are on both sides of the kind of immigration argument, where they refer to uh, as amnesty. All right, so uh, this was the idea for many people who are here who are kind of undocumented uh, that they were kind of like the um, if they met certain requirements, they're allowed, uh, allowed to stay. Um, if many could apply for citizen, you're not presenting your screen. Oh, crap. Sorry about that. Let me see. Hold up. Let me present. My bad, guys. Got to bear with Grandpa here. The VCR is flashing 12. Okay, there. Sorry about that, guys. 
So, like I said, the kind of the issue here with kind of what we refer to as undocumented um, immigrants, often sometimes referred to as migrants, and that is the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which again, with a lot of these acts, they're amended over time. Um, things are added, things are uh, deleted. Um, so this was the idea of, in a sudden, the concept of amnesty was uh, uh, was an issue there with this, but this was to kind of give some people, um, allow them to kind of apply for citizenship and need to, and also the attempt to kind of reduce the flow of legal immigration, particularly um, coming from uh, Latin America, but other areas as well, but primarily Latin America. So um, with this, again, immigration, unfortunately, at times becomes a kind of a volatile kind of political football, if you will. Um, and this has been kind of highlighted in the the last 20, 20 years, 25 years or so. And then just kind of recently with, uh, with, uh, things like, uh, that were trying to be implemented, like a travel ban on those coming from, uh, Muslim countries, uh, that again, the court kind of determined was, was, uh, unconstitutional. Um, you have a, uh, also a group that, um, uh, is referred to just recently as what they call dreamers. All right. And so uh, I'm going to skip this here. Uh, there's something uh, called the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals called DACA, uh, which allows for um, those who are brought to the U.S. as children, particularly uh, like a certain, uh, under a certain age, uh, to apply for citizenship. Like I said they're referred to as dreamers. Um, this was a executive action um, that was uh, issued by during uh, President Obama's term. I believe it was in 2012. I'm mistaken. Um, somewhat controversial, uh, and the current administration uh, was trying to uh, essentially um, have it overturned uh, on numerous kind of kind of factors and that. Uh, so this is this is the probably the latest issue that's dealing with um, with immigration. All right. Um, okay. So I'm sorry about the uh, the mix up there. Let me exit this. All right. Um, I'm gonna stop recording. Normally on Mondays. Normally on Mondays, um, I will give out a worksheet or something because Mondays are full remote days. But this Monday, you guys have another video to watch for the K-Hawk restart. Um, uh, it's not as corny as the one on Monday. I apologize for my garbage flow. Um, so I'm not going to give an assignment on Monday because you're going to have teachers that are, that are going to give you guys um, questions that are related to that. All right. So um, Tuesday, I want to finish up the uh, finish up the chapter. Um, Friday, we're going to test. We'll do a review game, though, on Thursday beforehand, do a Kahoot thing. And even if you're full remote, you'll have an opportunity to um, to join in because I think we're doing hybrid next week, as from what I understand. So um, test, just be, be aware, test on Friday, but tests are open notes. All right, so you get to use uh, these notes. All right.